Good morning, nice third Sunday afternoon. This morning's uh, sign was on 146, and so it starts off with Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will Zion for all generations. Praise the Lord.
God's love for us and our love for each other, and that's what uh, Jesus Christ is all about. So thank you to me for you being here today at the gathering. It's good to see everybody here. And, uh, keep in mind that we've got one more uh, Wednesday night class, is that right? At the Hampton this week. And of course we've got the Young Disciples on Thursday. So, uh, And then we've got uh, Christmas Eve coming up at the Hampton on Tuesday the 24th at 5 o'clock p.m. So keep that in mind. And of course we do have a service on the 29th, uh, the last service of this year, so that's kind of amazing. So we've uh, gone through another year, so the Lord's been with us. Any uh, birthdays or baptisms or good things to share? So, how you doing, Gary? <laughs> good to see you. Glad you made it. <laughs> Did you have to drag him here? No, he just gets a slow start. I mean, oh. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. He has got room. Yeah. 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 Must be all them Hallmark movies he's watching. Get <laughs> crammed yeah. like one of those old cars. You're <laughs> like <laughs> envision certain things you've got. Okay. So everyone doing okay? Yeah. How's it going, Jerry? Doing okay? It's fun. Yeah. <coughs> How's Ben doing? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. No contact lately? He's working a lot, but I haven't talked to him. He's still in that Florida. Yeah. All right, it's good to see everybody here. Oh, okay. You ready? ready? Okay. Please stand. We have Bible study tonight. Right? Okay. Right. Right. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In this Advent season of waiting on the Lord, we trust the Lord for our goodness. We rely on His mercy. We find shelter in His steadfast love. In this Advent season of waiting on the Lord, we walk in the Lord's way. We follow His example of love. We keep our covenant promises. In this Advent season of waiting, Lord, forgive our sins. Remember Your love. Remember each one of us. Remember Your people everywhere. In this Advent season of waiting, Lord, we wait for your salvation. We wait for your leading. We wait for your coming.
Jesus, our Savior. Prepare then the way of the Lord. or how we look at this. Um, one of the things that's coming out of this is, oh, it was up there, uh, is the new website. Steph recreated the entire new website. There's a blog on it that we'll be participating in. You have to subscribe to the blog and to the website separately or to, to the email. Right. To the emails <coughs> and the blog. From the blog. So, there are two different subscriptions. So um, the, the goal is to do a blog every week so that we connect with you and that the blog would be not necessarily about, you know, it's the Christmas Eve service, but really talking about faith and what it is and answering questions that you might have from the congregation and talking about theology and those things that we don't know about but sharing all of that so that we can have that conversation. And of course a blog is interactive so you'll be able to reply to it or ask questions or comment and then we'll, whoever wrote the blog that week will respond to you or tell you me maybe Eric and maybe Quinn, so we'll have the three of us interacting on that. Uh, yeah, you didn't know about that yet? <laughs> so, 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 just, just thought of that one this morning, so Surprise. we'll talk about that. <laughs> so anyway, um, we're really looking at uh, the way the early church does church, and there's a verse, Acts 2.42, um, and it talks about how the early church did church, and that they spent time listening to the apostles' teaching, they shared a meal, they broke the bread, they confessed, and they had fellowship, and so there's, so we're trying to formulate our service that we're following more the original disciples' way that the church was done and, and, and including in all of that whatever we can that would make it more biblical and really a little more unique which is what we keep saying we are so um, some of the changes will start in january just because we're going to try to ease them in so don't be surprised if it looks different in here um, and 
some of the physical changes that we're going to make are going to necessitate some of the other little changes, but uh, we'll talk about those more as we get them set in stone, and we can talk to you then. I mean, you'll, you can ask us questions or whatever. If you hate it, just let us know. If you love it, let us know. If you're in, eh, just don't let us know, whatever. Just, you know, we want to be the church, and we want to be this church, and so it, that requires all of us to be in a place where we're a community and a family together. So it's not like we're trying to push changes. We're trying to make this really the gathering of family for Christ. That's what we really want to do, and we want to enhance that experience so that it's more of a dialogue between all of us and God throughout the whole time. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, if you have any comments or suggestions or you're afraid of it, if you haven't heard of it before, this is the first time you're hearing of it, um, you can write and say, ah, or whatever you want to say. You know, we'll, we'll accept everything and anything. So, you can talk to us. Pardon? You can talk to us, too. Oh, yeah, you can talk to us. <laughs> but then you can't be anonymous. Can I, just, can I just say, and if you are actually are more of the online type of person, the questions that she's talking about that were in the bulletin last week are already a blog post, so if you're more of that online type of personality, you can, you can respond to us on the blog now. So you can give us feedback through the blog already, so if you just go the to... blog page, right, or uh, whatever? No, that's, no, that's going to be an e-newsletter that that's you're all going to receive tomorrow. <laughs> okay, there you go. Because we're trying to reach you in more ways. But if you just go to the gatheringforchrist.org, that's our website, and you will see a one of the pages is now called blog. So you can go there. There's right now two blog posts, which were just the two inserts that we've had in the newsletter, or in the bulletin the last couple weeks, for those people who maybe haven't been here either. So, um, in Florida. so the one that had the questions is up there as a blog post, but you can interactively write uh, responses to us up on the website, and we will see them in uh, yeah. Respond and or just read them so that there's feedback for us. And all this comes before the CBD. Yes, and uh, uh, wherever, however far we are, the 29th of December we have a CBT meeting, and we'll bring it all all at that point to that team, and then that team will examine and debate and question and figure and approve or disapprove, and that will be on the 29th of December. And from there, we'll make any changes if we're allowed to make any changes. So. You know, it was too, whatever. So we're in the process. Please be patient with us. I think it's going to make for a better experience with God every Sunday. I think it's going to change who we are and how we worship. And I think that's the important part. So please keep that in mind and be prayerful about your considerations and your comments. Um, seriously, if you have anything or any questions, please talk to one of us. Tell them of us. Howie, you. Eric, uh, Greg, and Stephanie, you. Cheryl, Ray, Laura, Linda. So there you go. Thank you so much. Please let's continue with the service. Okay. <coughs> the first lesson is from Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in sea. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is our God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible <laughs> okay, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. A haunt of jackals shall become a swamp, and the grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fool, shall go astray. No lions shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be 
upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and society shall flee away. The second reading is from James, chapter 5, verse 7 to 11. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rain. You also must be patient. Strengthen your heart, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed up endurance. You have heard us, you have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Here is the readings, please stand for the gospel. Okay, the Holy Gospel is from chapter 11 in Matthew. And this is where John questions Jesus. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see, that the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense to me. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John, and he said, What did you go out into, into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? When then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. <coughs> what then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, and I tell you more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Yeah, thanks be to God. Yeah. Last Saturday morning I had breakfast with Rich. Now I've known Rich for since 1982. He's a Lutheran pastor. And I first met Rich at uh, confirmation camp or confirmation camp. And uh, we were meeting at Carthage College at that time. So you're talking a lot of years since I've known Rich. Nice guy, uh, but Rich also had a brother named Pete, Peter. And uh, Peter was also at uh, Camp Formation, and Peter was like a couple of years older than Rich. Uh, but they were, what was amazing is there were like two peas in a pod. I mean, <laughs> they're both about the same height, except uh, uh, Rich was blonde hair and Peter had darker hair. Uh, Rich was a little bit more flamboyant and gregarious and musically inclined and always talking. Where, Rich was a little bit more, you know, reserved and uh, didn't have all the musical abilities that Peter had, but they were just a wonderful brother relationship. It was obvious to me as I observed, as I observed them over the years to see how close they were in that, that beautiful brother relationship that sometimes you don't really see much of. I mean, they hung together, they talked together, they had a lot of the same type of... Uh, of uh, conversations. They both went to Yale Divinity School. They were both pastors. I mean, it was just a, a marvelous relationship to, to watch uh, these two guys uh, get together and kind of do their thing, especially at Camp Formation, where they were a little bit more free to be themselves, you know. So, uh, but I said to myself, man, I wish I had a relationship like that with my brother. I mean, my brother and I, we love each other, but We've never really had much of a relationship, to be honest with you. I mean, even in, in uh, early years and in high school and in college, I mean, we were always kind of like going our separate ways. And of course, I've told you back in 1982 when I came here to Chicago, he took the whole family and moved to the West Coast with him, you know? 
So that kind of put a lot of distance between ourselves, but, uh, uh, you know, we still get along and we talk on occasion. But I was always kind of kind of jealous about Rich and, uh, and Pete, and I kind of said to myself, man, I wish I could restore my relationship with my brother in such a way, but I don't think that will ever happen. But anyway, my, my brother right now is dealing with, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, eventual demise of his lovely wife, Audrey, because she's in hospice right now, so keep them in their prayers. But anyway, so I was meeting with Rich uh, last Saturday. We always meet maybe uh, maybe once every two months at this uh, little location up there in, uh, in Glenview, and we have a great conversation. We get along. We uh, talk about things. But some of you may not know this, but about a year ago, uh, Rich's brother, uh, Peter, died. Yeah, died of cancer, uh, unexpectedly. And uh, this just devastated Rich because we're so close. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about Peter at these conversations we have at breakfast, it's uh, always kind of uh, difficult now because uh, of the feelings that Rich has about his brother and he and he said to me this past uh, Saturday when we met the last Saturday he said you know he said Eric you know um, uh, it came so unexpectedly I mean he, and Peter's wife died like a year before Peter died it was like oh my god but I never expected my brother to be gone I mean we were so close and and we were both deciding to to retire pretty much around the same time and we had all these plans laid out about what we were going to do in our retirement you know, because they did a lot of things together. They loved to sail. They loved to golf. I mean, we had all these plans. And, and he said, uh, now they're gone. And I said to him, I said, I know, Rich, uh, it's, it's, it must be devastating for you. But, but remember, uh, the Lord always has a way of restoring things in his own beautiful way. And, and I have a feeling that there's going to come a time where you and your brother, uh, Peter, are going to be playing golf beyond the pearly gates. <laughs> And it's going to be a beautiful golf course. And you're going to be sailing, you know, in, in, a, in this beautiful ocean because you love to sail. That's what I told him. Because the Lord always has a way of restoring things in his own beautiful way. So uh, that was last Saturday. And then last Sunday, I had an opportunity to uh, baptize my granddaughter, uh, Lucia. Lucia and Harleen. And so uh, that was kind of a neat experience. We uh, all met here here after, after worship. And... The whole Urso clan came in. You know, I talked about, you know, with the, with the people there when we, before the baptism, how my, my two kids have uh, been able to marry into big Italiano families. Uh, you know, the Gattastionis with my daughter, with, uh, with Rocco Gattastoni, and how beautiful those relationships are, and how I provided my kids with an extended family, and my grandkids with an extended family, and, and of course my son marrying into the Urso family, another beautifully big. Italian family and these Italian families, man, they're connected to everybody in Chicago. You know, if you need a plumber, if you need an electrician, if you need a lawyer, they got it all. You know, it's just amazing how these Italian families just have connections anywhere. You know, so uh, but we were here and we were we were celebrating the, the baptism of, of Lucia, and and I and I talked about the whole concept of, of, of relationships and how uh, we have uh, family relationships. Uh, like the Ursos and the Gepistionis, and of course the Ursos just recently went to, through the death of a, of, a, of a family member that was kind of tragic, but you know, I said, you know, God also has a great way of restoring things and bringing new life, and here we are baptizing little Lucia, and uh, that's the way God works. And so I also said that Lucia now, you know, she has this extended family of cousins and uncles and all this, but now through baptism, she is going to have also another extended family called God's family, and she's going to have all these new brothers and sisters in Christ, and now she's officially going to be an adopted daughter of God, God the Father, and I said, that's a beautiful thing. And I also said that Lucia, through this baptism, is going to be guaranteed that this relationship with God, the Father, will always be there for you. That was one of Luther's main points, is that baptism was a visible sign that God has touched your life and that he will never abandon you, forsake you, play games with you. He's always going to be there no matter what. Always going to be there. 
no matter what you do or say in good ways or bad ways or whatever, that relationship is always going to be there and little Lucia is guaranteed that through this wonderful act of baptism that we are doing today. And that was last Sunday. And uh, yesterday morning, uh, I had a breakfast. This was uh, with eight gentlemen at uh, Maxfields in Schaumburg. And these were eight guys that I graduated with from Elk Grove High School. No way. Yeah. So one of the things that I did uh, when I went to uh, uh, my 50th graduation uh, ceremony, um, well, not ceremony, but uh, reunion, uh, was I just said to myself, my gosh, you know, we're not going to be around much longer, <laughs> you know. And uh, I haven't seen some of these guys for 50 years. Yeah. I mean, I've kept track of a few of them. But here we are at this reunion. And that took place, I think, the, on the last weekends of September at uh, the Marriott in Schaumburg. And, and I said to myself, wow, wouldn't it be nice if uh, a few of us who live like in the Schaumburg, Hoffman Estates, Elk Grove, Itasca area kind of got together maybe once a month for breakfast or for dinner and just hung out together, kind of restoring our relationships. Because you know, folks, that's what it's all about. We are relational people. And we've got to constantly be working on restoring our relationships in any way that God sees feasible. We're just here as the means of that restoration process by making ourselves available or by taking initiatives and allowing God to do the rest. You know, and, I, and these guys, they all kind of knew me as, well, I was crazy in high school, just like I was in college, you know, so they were kind of like blown away that I was a pastor. You know? <laughs> and, and, and as usual, you know, they're, they're kind of skeptical at first, you know, they, they, they're not quite sure how you're going to approach them because some of them are probably accustomed to some of these guys coming up, oh, you know Jesus, you know, I'm not, nah, I'm not like that, you know, <laughs> which is nothing wrong with that, but that's just not my style. So, I mean, at first, uh, they're a little leery, you know, and talking to me, and, you know, after I say a few words, that maybe they didn't, you know, things, few jokes, whatever. You know, now they real, I'm a real guy, you know, so. But anyway, uh, so they were probably a little, uh, worried about, one well, bringing them together. Is this going to be like a prayer breakfast or whatever? But you know what? No, we just talked about, well, we don't talk about religion or politics. That's one thing we don't do. Mm -hmm. But we talk about our lives. We talk about where we've been. We talk about what's happened. And, and I think that's just a, a marvelous opportunity to touch base. Uh, and so we, we met this past Saturday at Maxfield's uh, in Schaumburg there. And it was a, a great thing kind of restoring our, our, our relationships and bringing things back. And um, so last night, though, one of the guys that we, we uh, that we're bringing together as part of that group of eight, uh, his name is Steve, uh, Steve uh, Pentall. And uh, Steve was uh, the quarterback of our football team when I was uh, playing football in high school. Nice looking guy. All the girls love Steve because you know, he's a quarterback. You know, quarterback with blonde hair and all this. But the last time I saw Steve was like uh, years ago, back probably around 1970, uh, in uh, a pet store in Elk Grove, right there in the corner of uh, Beasterfield and Arlington Heights store. There used to be a pet store there. And he worked in that pet store. And I walked in one day and said hi to him and said goodbye and whatever. And that's the last I saw of him. But uh, Steve volunteered to go to Vietnam and, uh, you know, had some injuries as a result of that and also was exposed to uh, Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, he uh, got bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night they had a celebration at his house uh, celebrating the fact that he had just gone through all his treatments and his final treatment was this past week. Mm -hmm. And apparently he's cancer-free, but you can tell 
that it's taken its, its toll on him. You know, that's the thing about treatments is sometimes it's kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time. That's just the way it goes. But we had a, uh, you know, a, a marvelous time last night uh, uh, at Steve's house there uh, in, um, in Hoffman Estates. But again, the whole concept of relationships and restoration and, and bringing people together. You never under, you don't have to always mention God for him to work in people's lives. Remember, you are a venue for the Holy Spirit. So, you know, in a beautiful way, I think maybe God is working through me to bring the Holy Spirit into some of these people's lives. I don't know, but that's the way God works. You know, we're just a vessel for that to happen. But anyway, uh, Steve, all these stories, I mean, what this guy went through, he spent almost a year and a half in the highlands of Vietnam fighting, you know, the Viet Cong and the... Uh, and the uh, NBA or whatever, yeah, just uh, unbelievable. But uh, I always tell you to him, Steve, you're special in my life because you're the the <coughs> only quarterback that I ever that I ever blocked for, and you will be the only quarterback that I ever blocked for as a as a pulling guard. And he says, Dawson, I don't believe how small you are. For a guard, but you did a pretty good job blocking for me. But back in those days, you could get away with pulling guards that were very small because the football players weren't that big. But anyway, that was last night. It's all about relationships. It's all about restoration. When I read today's gospel, it's all about the, that marvelous relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. Folks, what happened for those 30 years between uh, the baptism of Jesus and his, uh, not the baptism of Jesus, but his birth and his baptism <coughs> in the River Jordan by John? Well, I believe that John and Jesus probably hung around together during those 30 years. I mean, they were, they were close cousins. So, I mean, they must have had a, a great, almost like brother-like relationship, in my opinion. Uh, in those 30 years and probably assisted each other in the formulation of the game plan. I mean, they must have talked about, you know, where is God moving in our lives and what is he doing in your life and whatever. It was obvious that John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus on the banks of the River Jordan, was available for that baptism and was aware of what was happening when Jesus walked into the, into the water. So they must have talked about this moment and the fact that Jesus was going to start a ministry and that, and that John the Baptist was going to be the one to, to, to uh, initiate it and all that. But, but what's fascinating about today's gospel is that no matter how close John the Baptist and Jesus were in their growing up together for those many years, John was still caught by surprise in the way that Jesus handled himself as the new Messiah. It goes to show you how radical, how radical the whole messianic way that God moved through Jesus. Even John the Baptist, who was the last of the great prophets of the Old Testament, was, was thinking that, that Jesus was going to be all about destruction. Because if you read the Old Testament, the Messiah was all about destroying the enemies. <laughs> That's what it was. It's, you know, before any restoration could take place, you had to destroy your enemies. But here comes Jesus. There's no destruction. It's all about restoration. The blind shall see. The deaf shall hear. The lame shall walk. Those who are in prison shall be set free. It's all about restoration. God working to restore, not destroy. Think about that. It caught even John the Baptist by surprise. To the point that he had to send his disciples from prison and say, Hey dude, are you really the Messiah? What are you doing? You're not doing any destruction Messiah stuff. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to be a destruction messiah. 
that's all negative and destructive and non-beneficial. I'm going to be a restoration messiah that's positive and constructive and beneficial. And here, you've seen it yourself. Look at all the miracles that I've performed restoring the world around me. That's the new way that God is moving. It's all about restoration. Restoring our relationship with God through Christ and allowing that restoration process to be part of our lives and restoring ourselves and sharing that restoration process with the world around us. The vertical and the horizontal. Isn't that beautiful? And what's fascinating is that uh, <coughs> Jesus doesn't take offense. Here's one of your best friends. Are you the Messiah? Doing it publicly. It's like people coming up to me and saying, are you a pastor? Well, sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Are you really a pastor? Don't you? you see? I've never really taken offense to it, but it's the same type of thing. Are you really the Messiah? Wow. You know, if, if Jesus was egotistical like us, oh, how dare he, he question my messianic... I mean, think about it, how we get all huffed up when our egos get uh, crushed. Didn't phase Jesus at all. Because, you know, folks, his ego was never involved in this whole process. Ego means edging God out. He never did that. He instead lifted John the Baptist up. Isn't that amazing? He lifts him up and said, hey, John the Baptist is the one. He's the one chosen by God. Instead of deriding him and cutting him down, he lifts him up and says he's the one who was to come and start the process. God bless him. And what a great job he's done. And then he goes and he says, but unfortunately, John the Baptist is the last of the great prophets. He's not going to be privy to entering into this new covenant that I'm going to bestow upon you. He's, he's, he's passing the baton to me. He's done his relay stint, and I'm taking the baton and moving on. He's staying back here. But that doesn't make him a bad guy. It's just the way God designed his whole salvation process. But God bless John the Baptist for doing what he had to do. In fact, I call him the new Elijah. Woo! That was great. So again, this whole concept of God restoring our relationship through Jesus Christ, and uh, we're called to share that restoration with the world around us. I, I just find that to be amazing. So when I baptize Lucia, it's, it's just my way of reaffirming that whole concept that God, through baptism, gave me this wonderfully restored relationship as a gift that is eternal, that is permanent, that cannot be taken away, no matter what I say or what I do, and believe me, I take advantage of it, you know, and it's always going to be there. And God will never play games with me, forsake me, abandon me, and but my task is to take that marvelous restorative relationship, try to incorporate it in my life in that process of restoration, and then share it with the world around me. So that's what last Sunday reminded me of with Lucia. And so on, on Monday, uh, I get a text from my brother, uh, and he's telling me that Audrey's not doing well. You know? And so we have a little texting conversation. And I just said, uh, Mike, just hang in there. The Lord is with you. Hospice is there. Just make sure she's pain free. And he just texted back and said, thank you, bro. Thank you, brother. I mean, I just find that to be amazing. If I would have gotten all bent out of shape back in 1982, I, I would have never been able to text my brother and we wouldn't have that relationship, that long distance relationship we have now. But because God was part of my life, and Cheryl can vouch for this, I said to myself, even though I'm upset that he took the family to the West Coast, I'm not going to allow it to get in the way of our relationship because God restored my relationship with him, and it's up to me to keep that restoration process open 
even with my brother. God bless him. And here we are, you know, allowing that to work in this difficult time. And then on Tuesday, uh, we had a gentleman come in to uh, look at our furnace just to, uh, you know, service it. Uh, Ricardo was his name. Nice guy. He talked about the Lord. He told me he's a believer. And Ricardo made me aware that there was one little thing uh, as part of my furnace that he's never, that's never been cleaned before. And here he is cleaning it for me. Great. But Ricardo apparently didn't put it back properly. God bless him. And so throughout that whole day, we had problems starting our furnace, which, you know, was getting colder, so you get a little upset about that. So Ricardo came back several times to try to fix it, but was not able to find the problem. Uh, he apparently didn't retrace his steps about taking that piece out and putting it back in, which involved tubing and all this. So here comes the evening, and uh, I have to call this company and said, it's still not working. So they send another guy out named Diego. <laughs> Diego comes out and spends a couple hours. My wife had to stay home. She couldn't go to bingo. God bless her. And uh, yeah, what a sacrifice. But you know what? I wasn't ticked off at Ricardo. He did his job. He found something. I mean, I could have blasted him away. I could have been on the phone being nasty and mean like sometimes we want to be. But I didn't. I just let it be. Diego came over, spent a couple hours, really, finally found what was wrong. It was something that was hidden that probably Carter couldn't see and fixed it. And so what was amazing is I got home after our meeting as Diego was starting to leave and I had him roll down his window and I said, God bless you for all your work, Diego. I'm going to send an email to your boss tomorrow morning which I did say, thank you for a good job. That's the restoration God's looking for. Why do we have to always be nasty and mean? God doesn't work that way. If he was nasty and mean with us, we'd all be gone a long time ago. Why can't we share that same with others? And that was Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, I got a call from Don. I've known Don for, for years uh, since LCM. And we meet on occasion at the Starbucks up there north and... Uh, Schmail, and uh, or is it Schmale? <laughs> and uh, Don, I've worked with him over the years to help him to restore his relationship with his three kids. He's now got a restored relationship with his three kids, and then he shares with me on Wednesday that he's got seven siblings mm -hmm. that he hasn't talked to for <laughs> a year. Uh. I said, Don, you've got seven brothers and sisters that you haven't talked to. No. Well, well, I talked to one of them. I said, Don, dude, these are your brothers and sisters. We got to work on that. You see? But that's going to be my task from now on, is to get Don to start restoring his relationships with his brothers and sisters. See, God can use you in any way possible. All you got to do is make yourself available. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a great theological thinker. You just have to make yourself available, take the initiative, and allow the God work through you. And so that was one thing. And then on Thursday, I got a call from Jimmy. And Jimmy's doing pretty good. Now, there was a time when Jimmy was in jail. I hadn't talked to Jimmy for two years while he was in jail. Isn't that right? And then finally, I got a call from somebody that Jimmy had contact with that said he wants to talk to you. So, oh, no. So I had to make a decision at that time, was I going to restore my relationship with Jimmy, which means time, energy, and expense. And uh, so, which is okay. So I decided to make that, that, that restoration process, and I think it worked to his benefit. Because Jimmy has come out of jail, and things are working marvelously. Praise the Lord. He's sane, he's sober, he's working a program. And I think in many ways it had to do with the fact that God was working through me to help him reestablish his life. And he's met a wonderful girl named Liz. And I remember saying to him in, while he was in prison, Jimmy, don't worry about it. God's going to provide you with somebody that's going to blow you away. Well, within two weeks, he reconnected with this person that he had known before, and they are, you know, 
She's been saying it sober for 12 years. Just amazing, amazing stuff. But that's because God has worked through me and is now working through Jimmy. So that was on Thursday. And then on Friday, I got a text from Shannon. Remember Shannon? That uh, African-American that worked at Jewel? He's not working there anymore. I don't know where he lives, but I do text him and let him know that I'm praying for him and occasionally send him some funds. Because, like I said, he has no parents. His dad is dead, got shot. His mom's abandoned him. He's on his own. He's only like 20 years old. Aww. Yeah, living on his own. So, I mean, again, yeah, do I bother? <laughs> you never know how God's going to work to help this young man hopefully restore his life through just simple contact and support. Maybe him just knowing that somebody is caring for him might make the difference in the world. And then, of course, yesterday, I'm working at Jewel, and Andrew. Andrew's a guy that's got guns, and he can't wait till the government tries to get those guns from him. <laughs> <laughs> that's his big goal in life. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait till they come and help me, because I'll, I'll take care of them, and I'll go out in the glory. I mean, so Andrew, mm -hmm. just calm down, you know. And, of course, you know, he's kind of antagonistic. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He doesn't like people, whatever. But, um, and so, you know, some of the people that he works with at the meat department, you know, they kind of get on his case. And, and I said to him yesterday, I said, Andrew, he's all kind of pissed off, part of expression about how people are treating him and at the meat department. I said, Andrew, take it from me. I've known you uh, for about a year. I've worked with you for quite a few hours. And I have met thousands of people in my life. Thousands of people through my ministry. And I know how to read people. So take it from me, Andrew. You're, you're an all right guy. In my book, you're okay. Don't listen to what other people say about you. You're a good person. Yeah, you've got your foibles, but you're a good person. Wow, kind of at me. Affirmation. Affirmation, restoration. That's how God works. So remember, you're baptized. A marvelous restored vertical relationship is a gift. We take that and we allow it to restore ourselves, which is an ongoing process. And we share that restoration with the world around us. Please stand. We just thank you again for all that you do for us. We thank you again for being in our lives. And thank you for never abandoning us. For Son's name we pray. Amen.
we pronounce boldly what we believe. In love you came to a stable in Bethlehem to become one with us. In love you walked the plains and hills of Galilee and Judea to teach us how to live. In love you were nailed on a cross on Calvary to bear away our sin. In love you rose from a tomb in Joseph's garden to defeat death's power over us. In love you ascended beyond the clouds to be our reigning Lord. You came to love us so that we never feel unloved, deserted, alone, condemned. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. All these things we uh, lift up to you, these prayers of joys and concern. Just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful country we live in. And we wake up each day in the Google USA. And yet there's people like uh, Steve Benton who uh, fought uh, and sacrificed uh, for uh, our freedom, no matter where it's in, in this world. 
Let's all say amen. 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 In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated and come forward to the direction, please. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keeping us love, grace, and truth throughout the week. Amen. Amen.
Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you, folks. God bless you.